Okay, so I am going to guess that some of you are coming in. Oh, thank you, Chandler, for putting that right in there. For those of you that are starting to join, let's see if I can figure out who's who's coming out. Oh, okay, good, you're coming in. I can see you out there. Um, hi, my friend always. Hi, Katie. It's so good, so good, so good to have you be my first chatter in here. Thank you. So, hello, welcome. I'm going to give a few minutes here for people to, uh, to join us. And I will also, <laughs> 500 years, thank you. Hello, as you uh, can see, or perhaps if you haven't seen yet, there's a little chat window at the bottom of our Zoom, and I'm going to invite you to use chat to say hello, to introduce yourself, to tell, uh, to tell us, our shared community, where you are um, joining us from. That would be such a treat to know. And uh, just so grateful to be able to offer this and to be here with you. Really a treat for me. Hi, Sonia. We've got a few Oregonians here. We've got Katie and Bend and Sonia in Springfield, Nina right here in Longmont. This is going to go faster than I can read. Wow. Hello. Let's see if I can catch these. West Fargo, North Dakota from Mary. Kimberly from Seattle. Elena from Interior, Alaska. Woo woo! Alaska, favorite place. Um, Jody from Madison. Victoria from Kansas City. Um, hello, Laura from Central Illinois. Hi, Victor and Mom. My parents are here. I'm so grateful to you. Um, that's really a treat for me, uh, especially because here we are, you know, many of us quarantined or uh, sheltering in place in our own homes. And this gives us a chance to connect from all over. Bajita, if I'm pronouncing your name right, from India, welcome. And from Parker, right here in Colorado. Um, Maja or Maya, I'm not sure how to pronounce your name. Greetings from Slovenia. Love this. Hi, Kathy. My dear Kathy right here in Colorado. And Chantel from Alberta, Canada. And hello from Cleveland. And I'm not going to get through all of these, but I'm just going to keep scrolling down here. Florentina in Germany. Andrea from Romania. Inessa from France. I am so grateful for our uh, clearly our international community from Sweden and Bristol. Hi Kate, hi Lata. Um, so if I don't read all of your comments, please know that I am seeing you. Hi Heather, so good to have you here from Philly. Hi Cheryl, my fe fellow EMDR consultant in uh, North Dakota, so good to have you here. Really, really beautiful. Hi Victor again. So um, Hey Seneca, my sweetheart. Happy birthday. I know it's your birthday today. Um, from uh, we've got from from New York, from all of all of us are being impacted by what we're going through right now. And so I'm gonna shift gears a little bit. I'm gonna see that you're you're continuing to join uh, another from India, um, from Dubai. This is, this is really touching. Uh, so um, I have my um, assistant here, Chandler, and um, he's here with Monkey Creative. He's been my assistant that has helped very quickly. Two days ago, I had one of those wake up at three in the morning thinking to myself, I need to do this. I need to connect, uh, to, connect to this community. So uh, Chandler very quickly jumped on board with this. Hi, Tanya. Hi, sweetheart. Uh, to help make this happen. And um, so I'm grateful to all of you for joining and uh, grateful for the support that I have in being able to help help this happen. Uh, one last logistical thing is that if you had not seen in the email that you got at the bottom was a link to the handouts. And uh, Chandler has also put that right once again at the bottom of our chat box here. So you can scroll through the chat, the chat box. We've got Greece, we've got Greece represented, so beautiful. So, uh, hi, Jesse, you made it. I know you've been wanting to attend one of these. Jesse's in the UK and Turkey, Didim. Love you, sweetheart. Okay, so um, I'm going to take a moment here to invite us to really feel the back body because in, I know for myself that in connecting through a screen and really wanting to have our our joint connection um, and connecting to community in this new way, that it can feel a little disembodied as can this entire experience. So um, 
to take a moment to really feel yourself in your chair. Connect to your breath. Sense your feet on the ground. I'm right here, so if you want to take a moment, even close your eyes. And as I say in my yoga classes, just take a moment to invite all of yourself to arrive. So your mental body might have arrived here before your emotional body. And taking a breath to invite that emotional tone, that sense of how you're digesting, how you're processing, all that we're collectively experiencing. Just allow yourself to kind of fill your skin a little bit more. Connecting to your breath body, to the breathing, to the subtle movements of your breath as that invitation for more of yourself to arrive. and really feeling that physical body, your legs, any subtle movements you wanna take, your spine, your hips, your feet, that just help you feel yourself present. Perhaps even a sigh, letting your voice go, some subtle movements of head, neck, throat. Ah. Ah. So oh, just tracking, I know for myself that there have been waves and a lot of them, a lot of subtle and not so subtle tracking of tension that shows up as uh, we are inundated with information and uh, certainly just encourage us all to pace ourselves with the information that we're receiving about uh, this collective uh, process, this collective experience. We are also more united as a world than I have ever personally experienced. Um, I don't know that the world has experienced this, at least not in a long time to this degree. To be so deeply united in a shared, both frightening and um, an unsettling experience. And also, I think so many of us um, are joining here because we also can feel how our hearts are deeply connected in this, how deeply moved we are. Um, my biggest hope and intention for this time is that it allows us to really sink into that sense of connection and connection at all levels, connection with yourself, connection with your, um, yourself in a spiritual sense, whatever that means to you, uh, connection to a sense of community so that we really can feel the way that we breathe and and move together and are moved by this experience together. So for our time today, I'm going to bring some slides up on here. You'll still see me. Um, I will encourage you to keep using chat. I will keep that open as we go through. And I'm gonna to intend to spend about 25 minutes just sharing some information through slides. And then I'm gonna turn those back off and um, open it up for more conversation and dialogue and your questions and hopefully a chance to just respond. Um, and unfortunately, uh, Senta, we don't get to see each other because um, I think that as currently we have over 200 people on here, so we wouldn't be able to see everyone's faces. So you get to see me. I wish that I could see all of your faces. It is to me the, the hardest thing about these larger forums, the webinar set up on Zoom is that I don't get to see all of you. Um, but um, I know that we have other ways of connecting too. And if we're not on Facebook together, share, share your, your pictures of yourself there so I get to know. And uh, Didim, thank you. I'm glad it's grounding for you to see me. And um, I will really hold in mind, there's so many of you that are on here with me whose faces I know because we have connected in one way or another. And um, Chandler, would you check Sharon? Just raised her hand. I'm gonna invite you to check that one. Um, so, 
you know, so knowing that, you know, Jesse or Katie or Victor and my mom or Didim or, um, or Seneca, Tanya, that there's pieces, you know, people that I have either sat face to face with or have met in other forums, forums more intimately. Um, thanks, Sharon. Uh, that, that it's good for me to imagine you there and to imagine your faces. It's very grounding for me as well. So I'm going to go ahead and, and pull up uh, some slides here. And, and then you'll, you'll see me again in a moment. Um, thank you. Thanks for holding my back, Crystal. I, I'm going to lean into that. That is so, so good for me. And uh, <laughs> I'm going to imagine the cinnamon rolls. All right. So here's, here's some information that I put together. It's, it's, um, hard, it was hard to choose what. I'll be honest, there's so much that I feel like is in my heart to share. Maybe the first is just a, a little story and, um, and then we'll go into some more slides. My story is that um, yesterday I had set up a Zoom call with a, a dear healer who's been someone that I've worked with for over 20 years. And um, it was remarkable how stoic I didn't realize I had been. I had just been carrying on and doing a lot of good self-care. Many of you know I'm nature walking every day and I'm yoga-ing every day, if that's a verb, right? And, and, um, and yet still, with all of that, there was a uh, I want to say it just felt like a, a tidal wave behind behind the 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 well-protected wall. And as soon as I let that guard down in a space that I knew that was safe, it just uh, poured out, right? Um, so I'm so grateful to have places to pour out because we don't want to approach this with stoicism. And I have a uh, you know, a family lineage of, of Stoics, and it comes, it come, I come by it honestly. And so to recognize that, sure, we're going to hold and we're going to find tension and we're going to, um, we're going to experience our defenses. They're natural, that we don't want to make any of those wrong. Uh, but we also all need places where we feel like we can let down that guard. And uh, I do really believe that we can do that even across our physical distancing, right? That we have these other social forums to connect. And so that's really where, um, where we're going to connect from. So the first piece that I just want to want to kind of honor here is that with fear, we also have our memory of fear. That the um, that our memory of fear will come through the gates of whatever the, the current activation of that is, right? So it's our state dependent memory that whatever emotion we're dropping into is gonna basically bring to the forefront other times where we felt that same way. So if we start to feel afraid, we will more easily remember other times when we have felt afraid. And it can lead us down this downward spiral, right? It can take us into some pretty dark places. And it's not that we want to reject or deny the darkness. It's more so that we want to pace ourselves with that as well. That we want to know that if we're going to some difficult emotions, that we have places to reach out and ways to connect so that we don't feel that we get stuck there. And to also know that we can counter that downward spiral through um, tapping into other emotional and psychological states that help us feel uplifted and hopeful, grateful. Um, and it's not to deny the difficult feelings of fear or sadness or anger um, or shame, all of which are valid and have their place. It's just to know that we want to be able to hold, uh, you know, what, what Zorb with the Greek called the full catastrophe, right? We want to be able to allow ourselves to, to know that we can touch into the both and. Uh, Deedam writes, that, always, that already made me cry. Yes, right? Like here we are, this feeling the you know, the threshold place between um, where we can touch into our deepest loneliness, our deepest fears, and also find the cracks that let some light in. 
So we can use our state dependent memory to tap into an emotion of hope or gratitude, and it will help us remember other times that we felt less alone, more hopeful, more connected. Um, and then we can go back and forth. We can touch into the scary places and tap into the, the resource, uh, both and. Yes, exactly, Nina. That, that's us, right? We're going to do the both and, and that's my intention for us today. So in practice, what this can look like is making an agreement with self to attend to our emotions in right time and right space and to give ourselves permission to take breaks from focusing on the difficult feelings and memories. That we can, in those moments, if it's hard to transition out, right, especially if you have a, a history of trauma, sometimes we can get um, kind of caught or feel stuck in the pain, into the contraction. And um, so if you're finding that happening for you, if you're finding yourself going into some of those, uh, those darker places and you can't find the, the cracks that let the light in, right? Um, you might reach out to someone and we'll talk about a whole variety of strategies. Um, you also can simply begin to focus your attention on cues in your environment that help you know that you are safe here and now. All right. So if you look around your space, if you can hold something in your hand, you know, I, I personally have with me uh, pretty much always some form of an essential oil that's just at hand as a tool. Our olfactory sense is a direct connection into the limbic brain. And so finding some sensory experience, right, having a sip of tea and just focusing on that, that sense of taste. So tuning into your external senses if you start to feel at any point overwhelmed or flooded. And, you know, as, as with my own experience yesterday with my own floodgates opening and feeling like there'd been a tidal wave sitting behind it, um, we need spaces to just let it pour out. But I know for myself that it helps to have someone uh, share that holding, right? To be able to offer the container of their loving presence. And my biggest hope is that we all have people in our lives that can serve that purpose. And that even if you don't have a one-on-one -on -one, that you can actually kind of feel the collective energy of the fact that we have, you know, so many of us here with this shared intention right now and that this can also be a container that you might choose to allow this hour that we have together to support you to feel um, and to know that you can come in and out of that. Emily writes, thank goodness for my containers, big time, right? Big time. So disorientation and confusion, right? I don't know about you, but that's been the uh, the places of, uh, of difficulty in all of this, starting to feel disconnected from self, uh, perhaps moments of feeling cut off from our sensations, cut off from the body, feeling numb of emotion, feeling like this whole thing is surreal, right? Feeling confused, anxious or out of control. That difficulty of holding the reality of what is happening. I can assure you that if you are experiencing any or all of these, you are not alone. I can also tell you that I'm experiencing them too. You know, in coming forward to offer, you know, wisdom or, or counsel in this hour with you, I'm not coming because I've got it all figured out. I'm coming because I'm as human and um, I have my struggles. The other, the other day, two days ago, uh, between the, the time that I decided to do this and here, uh, we had it just what I would call the big family meltdown, right? My husband is feeling the stress. We have my 83-year-old mother-in-law with Alzheimer's that lives in our home. We have two teenagers and he and myself, and we just cracked. There was a moment of feeling like we don't have backup care for her. And um, we all kind of devolved into our lowest common denominator selves, uh, everyone needing a little bit of something and, uh, and no one feeling like they had enough to give. And those moments are hard. Uh, 
and we all experience them. We're not, we're not, you know, we're going to experience them. Um, we also want to be able to have our oxygen masks, right? We want to have those ways of being able to resource ourselves so that we can come back to ground when those difficult mom moments happen. Uh, Jacqueline writes, uh, thank you for saying that you don't have it all figured out. Uh, seriously, right? Um, and, you know, th the key is not that we're going to have it all figured out or that we're going to be perfect in this. We are not. Uh, but I really believe that when we have our moments of being messy, that it can help us have compassion for others, but it's going to start with having compassion for ourselves. So that, you know, for example, in the moment where I'm yelling and I can bring it back and I can do the repair work with my kids or with my husband or with myself and have compassion and know that I'm not a bad person for having lost my temper or, um, I lost my shit if I can say that on here, right? You know, like, like we're gonna have those moments. Um, yeah, yeah, it's been so hard to concentrate and focus, Nina says. Yes, says Bridget, right? Um, and it, it has, it's, it's hard. Um, and uh, we're gonna climb into a foxhole together, yes. So, um, all right. I know that I'm not alone and I'm really appreciating your comments because these messy moments are going to be there. And from what we can tell, they're going to be, we're going to be in this challenge for a while. This is not, as uh, someone else said yesterday, it's not a sprint. We are in for the long haul. And, um, and so we're going to need to rest more than ever. We're going to need to uh, draw upon patience and, um, and compassion more than ever. And I really do feel like many of us have been preparing for this for a while, whether we knew it or not. There has been some collective preparation phase uh, that has been going on. Crystal writes, we're gonna have to co-regulate on a scale never needed or understood before. Agreed. Um, Elena, I'm all over the board and restless. Yes, struggling to sleep, Heather says. Absolutely, me too. The 3 a.m. is a tough time. Uh, that's been my wake up time as well. And Laura Wright's been down uh, and my teenage daughter said they're worried about her. Yes, and then you had a great talk. That is it, right? That we're gonna have our tough moments. And then, and then I'm finding this too, that the most profound conversations can happen on the other side of these. Something else that's happened for me is that so often I've taken my personal practice outside of the, the house, right? Like I've gone to the studio to practice yoga while well, they're all closed. So I'm practicing at home. So my kids see me practice every day. They're, they're sometimes stepping on my mat, which drives me a little nuts, but you know, it's in the house. My big cry yesterday was right here in the house. They all heard it, right? It's very, it's much more integrated in a way that actually feels important. And so even though our kids might worry about us when they see us cry, it also is going to be very real. And I think that's good too. Uh, it can be hard to concentrate. Christine is a mom of a seven-year-old, closed up with her, trying not to lose it. But you have, I have too, I get it. Dolphins can only understand themselves in relationship to others, as social needs are that important. Maybe we have more to learn from them. I agree with you there too. And Lori's watching this right from her mat. Thank you. Um, so yeah, it is hard to ask seven-year-olds to, to self-regulate when we can't regulate. So it is about that oxygen mask. And as much as our losing it can bring up guilt and shame, we are going to do our very best to then loop back around to compassion, you know, to catch the regrets of behaviors that we're not proud of, and then be able to say, okay, I regret that. I didn't handle that well. Jesse, Jesse writes, I'm just so numb one minute and then anxious the next. I've just left the hospital and it's a scary time. I'm grateful for mom and I know she's safe and the dolphins. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you for your comments. That's what helps us feel connected in this. 
And for those of us that have a history of trauma or complex PTSD, we can feel extra vulnerable, right? It's going to tap in through that that state dependent memory to the other times when we have felt alone, helpless, frightened, um, childhood trauma can get stirred, right? Um, I know for me that feeling of really deep loneliness, some of you probably saw my post yesterday on Facebook about uh, the in-between place, this little, little it was Robin, the uh, Kermit the Frog's nephew, sitting in the middle of the stairs. And that's just what it felt like for me, like just this little, little part that felt alone and scared and sad. And um, and it was, it was little, right? It's, you know, maybe, maybe two years old. And, um, you know, so that like the best that I could do, because the honest thing is that in that moment, I wasn't going to self-regulate around that. I needed somebody to help me find her and to hold her. And, um, and so when we feel, as, as Connie says, so alone, or Anessa, when I wake up feeling like this might be my last day, right? This is a big feelings um, that we want to be able to kind of wrap our consciousness and our hearts and emotionally be able to tune into these places. Um, Nicole writes, part of the disorientation for me is that I have higher states of seeing how perhaps this is the change we have been longing and waiting for. I completely relate to that. Um, and it's showing up different than how we expected. So we have signs of collective awakening and environmental recovery, absolutely. But we also have our fears and our low places. And so how do we bolster flexibility for those wild state changes? I think naming them just as you have done, just being able to kind of hold that full catastrophe that we are collectively in, to know that they can both coexist, that one doesn't cancel out the other, and that we can, as you say, have these kind of higher awareness states, which are profound, and we need them, and we're going to be so human, and we're going to be big self and small self all at once. Um, Dave writes, I've been living this way for over eight years, essentially homebound bec um, as it becomes a new normal, but that's okay. I've had to a full life before everything fell apart eight years ago and I've adjusted and I'm still here and still healing. You know, Dave, that's been a conversation I've had with quite a few of the people who I have the opportunity to, to work with as clients, many of whom have been living with chronic illness for a long time. And, um, and so in some ways, this preparation has been um, long-standing for many people, uh, whether that's been at a physical level or a deep emotional level of having known one's deep loneliness, as Sonia writes, um, having just lost your father right before this epidemic hit. I'm so sorry for your loss. How do we process all of this at the same time? We don't. We can't process it all at once. That's why I really believe that we are going to have a long view. We need to keep a long uh, perspective on this, that one of the, the lessons for me about my own process yesterday was that I couldn't process it all at once. I actually had to just take the front edge of the tidal wave and work with what felt like the, the, a ripple of the bigness of it. And working with the ripple is enough in any one given moment, right? So that for that half an hour or hour, if you can just catch one edge of the distress and be able to attend to that with deep care, right? That's enough for that period of time. And there will be more ripples and there will be more waves. And when we take that long view, we're going to have time to come and attend to all of those in right time. Um, uh, Lizzie writes, it triggers my inner, if I'm pronouncing your name right, my inner child for sure, complex PTSD. I'm in lockdown in New Zealand, have no opportunity for physical contact with my two containers for um, hugs and reassurance, and no idea how long. It feels so young and so very vulnerable. Absolutely. Um, social distancing for some can be relieving, right? It can be a break. Um, so there's, we have everything, the whole range, the descent and the rising from Katie, the uh, activate our trauma and wound stories, right? That oscillation, disequilibrium, focusing on the small basic tasks can help. I can't tell you how much cleaning and dishes I have done in this house this week. Good thing we're all in the house. We make a lot of dishes. 
get to wash a lot of dishes. <laughs> it's very grounding, right? So how do we manage uh, duty rights when we simply block and compartmentalize our fear, anxiety, anger, and then realize that we're blocking and then it just dumps out, right? Where is the balance? I think that that's what we're speaking of here is finding titration as Peter Levine would say, right? Just like we tune into little bits and then we back out and little bits and back out. And if we find that we have compartmentalized too much, um, then we want to uh, really find those spaces where we can unpack the containers. Yeah. Uh, it feels like when you were in deployment, Jacqueline writes, when you had no control of your environment and you're experiencing flashbacks. <sighs> right, right. That's it. Yeah. And I think being able to name it and have yourself be seen and heard, that is huge, right? Um, just tend to the ripple, Amy writes. That's, that's, uh, that's an important analogy. Yeah. Um, pillows and blankets can be helpful. This one too, right? You might do this with me just to feel your own contact with yourself. This is called havening and you can read about it on YouTube or on the internet, but being able to take your um, hands to opposite arms and just really soothe yourself with that contact. You can even imagine who you wish were giving you that very soothing hug, right? And you know, what if you've already been emotionally numb and disconnected from old trauma? So now it's a matter of wanting to feel, but uh, also, um, you know, it can be hard if you don't, if it's hard to come into feeling. I absolutely hear you. Yes, there's, there's, there's just some of, some of everything here. And um, that part of how we can come back into feeling if we're stuck in numbness, which is so common, right, is to ground. And we're going to talk about that here just a, a little bit further. So hang on to that one, Senta. We'll, we'll come back to your question. Um, uh, so Jesse writes, yes, Deedam, the social distancing can be a double-edged sword. It can be both comforting and challenging. Uh, disconnected from your heart. It can feel unreal and surreal, for sure, for sure. Ah, oh, Didim, I didn't know you were pregnant. Congrats. And I can understand how the stress of this might, um, might be scary right now. What I would suggest is that for those of us who have young children or are pregnant, or just even have those young ones inside of us, that when we can pull in that ability to really hold ourselves and to, um, to find those state-dependent positive experiences of hope, of love, uh, someone else here, oh, Kara, I know you're pregnant, my sweetheart. Um, you know, really lots of holding that little one, as Kara writes. Exactly. Um, dancing, Dina writes, is helping you to move and enjoy being in your body. We need to have these ways to connect into positive and nourishing self-states. And, you know, one last piece that's on this, uh, this slide before we go on is this recognition that part of what might also be emerging forth is this trauma across generations, right? The, the trauma of our ancestors um, that is kind of cellularly awakened that when we are um, feeling some of the collective trauma that we can remember other collective traumas that our ancestors, ancestors have faced. And on the one hand, uh, that can be frightening and again, unsettling, ungrounding. We can also remember the resilience that our ancestors found, right? You are here because of their resilience. Uh, one of the, the pieces about resilience that touches me so much is this, this remembering that not only can there be vicarious traumatization, certainly through reading the news and scrolling through some frightening articles, but we also have vicarious resilience. And that when we can hear stories of how other people are coping um, with difficult experiences with um, with that resilience and, you know, like the, the people singing on their balconies in Italy, right? Um, I mean, this is extraordinary. Like when that story hit, we all felt it. We felt that vicarious resilience. It's extraordinary. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't know if any of you have watched some of these virtual COVID-19 
requires, I'll post one on my page that made me cry yesterday, uh, Bridge Over Troubled Waters with these, this choir that couldn't get together. I think they were high schoolers that couldn't get together in person. So they sing through one of these virtual choir sites. It's so beautiful to find ways that we can connect. Kathy writes, gardening helps you ground birds and animals and enjoying the spring. I am finding that as well, that when I can get outside, whether it's in the garden or I've got a path near my house, it is making a huge difference. Keep writing in there what's helping you. It'll inspire, inspire each other here. Um, social isolation and stress. So in a way we're already, um, uh, Senta, you can send this to your uh, son and his wife who are pregnant. This was all recorded and it will all be shareable. Um, dancing and writing from Tanya, yes. So how we're coping with social isolation and stress or physical isolation um, is, you know, that, that some of these things, as we've already said, are happening. We're arguing uh, with loved ones. We're blaming and pushing people away. We're yelling at our children. We're feeling isolated. And what I hope to communicate through the image here is that ability to come back. I keep having to remind myself that when myself, my husband, my kids, my mother-in-law, when any of us are having those difficult emotions, that it's because underneath there's a need. And that when we can get out of reaction, which is not always easy, when we can come out of reaction, then we can, um, can respond in that more compassionate, loving way, that we can come back to our kids and go, oh, I understand you're acting out because you're afraid to. You're acting out because you're needing my attention, right? And that we can come back, right? Um, so some of the, the beautiful ideas that are coming through here, and I'm just gonna read a few of them because wow, you just filled the page, it's so gorgeous. Meditation through Headspace app, it's such a great app, I have it on my phone. Walking and learning to crochet, how cool is that? Coloring, uh, we have a YouTube link here, that looks cool. Um, uh, seed starting. We've got our seeds in our window right now. Thank you, Jody. Um, Ashton did Tai Chi, helping to ground. Uh, Jesse being with pets. Love that. Um, sitting outside, soaking up that vitamin D in the sun. Yes. Ode to joy. Musicians playing from all over the world. Put that link in here. I'd like to, oh, is that we, that's what the link was, Christina. Thank you. We will listen to that. Finding new creative activities with our kids, right? Doing yoga, listening to podcasts, guaranteed family dinners. We are all in this together. We're in the house together. We're gonna to be eating together. Online Feldenkrais, gorgeous, good. Walking the dog, cooking and baking, box breathing, right? Four in, four hold, four out, and holding it out, lovely. Writing, drawing, knitting, and they're gonna just keep coming in, so I'm not gonna read them all, but keep looking. Um, and we can, again, review all of this later. <laughs> Tidying up, I like that, good. Um, all right, so here's, here's some, some more. Um, hmm. Okay, so co-regulation, right? We can hold more together. Our connections with each other are gonna help us hold more than we can hold ourselves, more lovingly, more compassionately than will we be able to attend to our own pain, then, you know, when we feel unconditionally accepted by others, when we feel loved and understood by others, it helps us do that for ourselves. And it's gonna be this give and take, right? Um, some of you may be familiar with the work of Saban Fu or Maladoma Somme. Um, they they came, uh, come out of Burkina Faso and the Dagaru tradition, Dagara tradition. And um, they're, grief work is so apropos to this time and that there's an altar that's set up in the community for our grief and that we're either walking to the altar because the grief is rising up in us and we allow ourselves to grieve or we are the one that in that moment has the resource to be able to support the griever. And that at any given time, we might be in one or the other of those roles, right? We might be the active one who's feeling the pain, the fear, the grief, the, the anger, and we might you know, really need our support people. And then there's gonna be times where, um, where it's gonna where it's gonna flip, it's gonna be the other side. Sabonfu and Maladoma Somme from Burkina Faso um, and uh, Somme S O M 
E is I believe. I believe that you have that right. And if someone else knows the answer to that, you can put that in there uh, into the chat box. So there's going to be times when we're going to reach out. There's going to be, thank you, Dan. there's going to be times when we're going to um, need to give and there's going to be times when we're going to be on that receiving end. Thank you, Tanya. And, um, and so to know that there's going to be the both and in here and, um, and to trust that when you feel that it's time for you to give your give, give your gifts, that they're needed, that they're wanted by this world, and um, that that what you have is of value. And I think that giving side can be so profoundly soothing and healing as also being on the receiving side. And as my uh, stepdad, Victor, and I were talking uh, yesterday, you know, some of us get stuck in one side or the other. Some of us are givers and don't stop to receive. Some of us are more comfortable with receiving. And so if you're on that giver side, if you're the one that has a hard time stopping, slowing down, letting yourself be cared for, this this is your challenge. This is your challenge to actually stop and let yourself be cared for. So in all of this process, collectively, we're just trying to digest our individual and shared experience. And literally, I mean digest. Uh, my, my dear friend Katie was sharing with me how, like, uh, how, you know, her stomach was really active. And I said, mine too. There is a way in which we are just trying to, um, to make sense of something that's very, very non-digestible in so many ways. Yes, someone who died last year, she transitioned last year. Um, and, uh, and that, you know, to, to know that, it, and likewise, we may need to take this in bite-sized pieces, just like those little ripples, like we're not going to digest all of this at once. We don't even understand it. How can we digest it yet, right? But little, little bits. Meditation can help with digestion, absolutely. Compassion practices, right? Scooping up those younger parts of ourselves that may need extra attention and care and compassion. Imagine holding any young, frightened parts of yourself lovingly with kindness. And for those who have dissociation, complex PTSD, and, and with that, um, parts that are very hard to love or parts that reject other parts of yourself. So we're really talking that that level of complexity here, it can sometimes be very difficult to hold those parts with compassion. And if nothing else, just know that, that there is a whole field that gets that and that sometimes all we can do is imagine having compassion for someone like ourselves and to inch that compassion toward ourselves. Or imagine someone else having compassion for you if you can't have compassion for yourself. So there's a lot of compassion strategies out there and we can draw upon Kristen Neff's work for that. And um, there's uh, tools in the post-traumatic growth guidebook and, and um, other tools out there for how we can bring that compassion in. So reaching out to loved ones, gratitude for family time, having faith, um, and uh, taking a slow pace. Someone wrote up above that the Pope just did a beautiful address too. I want to find that one. So thank you for sharing that as well. So here, as we've been speaking, we want to embrace our emotions. We want to go there. And I know for some of us, that's hard. Um, so we can find as much as possible little bits, right? Um, turning toward fear. Most often we actually won't even be able to fear our feel, fear until we're safe enough to feel it, right? And um, to make room for that fragility. But, uh, you know, um, excuse me, it's, it's supposed to make uh, room for, not from for. So, you yeah, know, little, little bits here, but just to make room for our fragility, to honor our vulnerability and our sadness. Anger has been coming up and as much as possible, get angry at the virus, get angry at whatever you need to, but feel that anger, let it help you tap you into strength, get on your yoga mat with it, feel your legs, feel your body, feel your spine, feel your core, anger is not a bad emotion. We want to channel it. It can help us set boundaries. It can help us be clear minded, clear headed. We need it. We need it now in really good serving ways. It can help us speak out for social justice, right? It can help us um, 
tune into where the need is and be able to find the strength to meet those needs because it's tremendous out there. Uh, the space where I usually teach my yoga classes, our community center, which is walking distance from my house, has been turned into a COVID recovery center. So the volunteers are going in there um, uh, daily and uh, there are people there that are from our local jail and from our homeless centers who are all uh, positively diagnosed with COVID and are um, receiving care right here in our community. I walk by there seeing those volunteers go in. I mean, tremendous strength that, that people are tapping into now. It's huge, right? And um, yes, we want to turn toward our shame as well. I'm going to turn here. Jesse writes, I have complex PTSD. I feel like my inner kids are constantly driving the bus. Um, I think collages can be helpful. Self-compassion can be hard. Absolutely. Um, yeah, so when we find those young ones driving the bus, can we pull that adult online? Can we let the adult be the one that can hold those younger parts? Christina writes, it's interesting that you put shame with belonging. How is that related? For me, I so often feel that shame is the most isolated of the emotions. It's the one that feels like there's no place for me. There's no place in the world that could possibly understand what it's like to be me. There's no place that could love me, that could love this part that's so undeserving of love. And that at the same time, shame is the emotion that I believe taps us in most to the collective experience of isolation and lack of belongingness. When we can turn toward our shame and recognize that that is the most profound connection to compassion for humanity, that it can absolutely take us toward a sense of belongingness. Exactly. Deedham writes, shame is the feeling of not belonging. That has been my experience, uh, both for myself and for the people that I work with. And that, um, that you know, Brene Brown's work on shame has some beautiful wisdom in this regard. Uh, her, her TED talk would be a great time to listen to that um, shame and vulnerability and how it can also help us access our positive emotions, including joy and hope. Um, uh, so spot on with shame that I don't belong here. Um, yeah, there it is. There it is. So. Um, embodiment right so this is this is my go-to as much as possible is to come back to grounding to breath to boundaries uh, to get on the yoga mat or to be outside to put feet on the earth to be in your garden right all of these different ways that we want to be able to um, to tap into the way that our body can help us connect to our resources right the strength that lives within us the breath that we have, and also uh, to understand the impact of what's happening in our world and how that's showing up. How is the stress response in your body to come back home? And that also to know that our body can guide us toward healing and restorative movement. That we can allow sensations like trembling or shaking um, or conscious movement, walking in place, touching your legs, feeling yourself in space, right? That we can do all of that as ways to help reclaim uh, healing. And that we can integrate what, as uh, one of you said earlier, this extreme of these higher states of consciousness and the fear that we can integrate all of that, I believe, as an embodied experience. So in practice, grounding, right? To settle your energy downward. I find that so often our emotions start to sequence upward, but when there's a lot in the heart, when there's a lot to digest, it actually can feel very constricting to try and move all of that up and out. The tears can only get us so far. We want to sequence downward as well. So if you can feel the bowl of your pelvis as the container, if you can feel the connection of your pelvis to your legs, sense and feel, bring awareness to your legs and feet, press your feet into the floor, wiggle your toes, press your feet in and feel the engagement of the muscles in your legs. Feel that connection to the downward pull of energy to the core of the earth. That in that way, not only does that also help us feel like we can belong, but also can help recognize that that which is larger than us can help us hold what feels 
like it's too much for any one person to digest. That which is not digestible, turn it over. You can turn it over to God if that's in your vocabulary, to the universe, to the cosmos, to the earth, to something that's larger than you, so that we ourselves can just be the small self sometimes, just digesting those little bits and turn over the, the, the enormity of this to something that's bigger than us. are somatic interventions, right? If the feeling that gets stuck in your body, here are some things that I'm gonna offer. How does that sensation wanna move? Is there a sound for it? Can you breathe into that feeling in your body? Can your arms and hands express it? Can your whole body help move it? Can you push with your arms or with your legs? Can you step in place? Can you take it for a walk outside? Can you dance in your living room? Can you reach for connection and pull it all the way into your core? Can your face, all the little muscles of our social nervous system, ah, move your jaw, your eyes, oh, 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 let the sounds, right? I could do that for the whole rest of our time here, but I'll encourage you to keep doing it on your own and, and I'll continue after we're done. Um, Jane writes, uh, my first time connecting to such a group and feeling like you belong. Deep gratitude for that comment. Thank you, Jane. <sighs> all right. Uh, Dave writes, it's uh, 3 a.m. is a very normal time to wake up. The spiritual world is at its height at 3 a.m. No matter what time zone you are in, it's always going to be 3 a.m. That's so, so funny. That really is my time, too. And the spiritual forces that are dark and always at their strongest. And it, it is interesting. It truly was a 3 a.m. Uh, moment uh, three nights ago when I woke up and I said, I have to do this, this webinar with you. So, so I'm grateful for all of you for showing up with me. Um, yoga and pendicular movement. If you're not on Facebook with me, I've been putting a whole bunch of little yoga snippets on there. And, um, and what I would say, just if you're not familiar with pendicular movement, think of this as a whole body yawn, right? And uh, I've talked about this in some of my other webinars, but it's very, very deeply healing. It's not putting yourself in a prescribed position that sometimes yoga can be. It's really about letting any shape that you take be a home base for exploration so that you can kind of let yourself just move guided by the sensations in your body. Ah, let there be sound with it. And all of these movements are resetting the brainstem. It's like a, it's like a rush of fresh oxygenated blood right into the lower brain deeply, deeply nourishing. So keep moving. I think we're going to have to move our bodies through this. And for, for those of you, I have, a, I have a dear friend who's a quadriplegic. Moving doesn't necessarily have to mean physical movement, right? We can move in these subtle ways of the breath and subtle movements and fingertips and even imagined movement can be movement. Um, sequencing frozen or truncated movement, sent us, uh, sent us as a question if I'm uh, getting the bullet that you're asking about here. So sometimes we, um, the, the energy can feel like it gets stuck in the body, right? So it's like it's in the throat, it's in the chest, it's in the belly. Belly's my place for holding. And so, um, you know, so being able to find those stuck places and be able to find the subtle movements with breath or the large body movements that help that, that stuck energy into movement once again. Um, so we can move it with breath, we can move it with awareness, and we can move through actual physical movement. Art materials are a great, great way to have movement. Um, yeah, you don't have to be down on the floor for this. As you can see, I'm doing this right here from my chair, Nina. And so all of this can be done from standing and from seated. A lot of my practice is right from standing. Um, and sometimes just it's just part of my walk outside uh, in the air. So, um, so, so lots, of, lots of really beautiful ways. Um, to, to find this. And again, it doesn't, I don't want it to mean that we all have to be flexible in order to benefit from this. Uh, uh, Christina writes, humming in a low tone can be really grounding when you feel stressed and triggered. I completely agree. Peter Levine has a 
breath, right? So that we can have this foghorn vu, V-O-O, um, that just resonates with a vibration into the lower body as ways to move some of that stuck energy. Acceptance and allowing. Um, Notice resistance to our painful feelings. If we can, can we allow them to just be there? What I find is that there's this paradoxical experience with accepting, that as we turn toward what's painful or difficult with acceptance, there can be this um, rolling out of a sense of relief. And um, I just think that's so often uh, the case, but sometimes it can be scary to turn toward those difficult feelings, those difficult sensations. In those moments, we want to remind us that all of our experiences are meant to come and go. It's like water moving in a stream. No Notice your thoughts, your emotions, your sensations, and let them flow. You can use the mantra of I am letting go. And so you can feel those little ripples or big ripples and let them move on with breath, with movement. Resilience is not a trait that we have or don't have. It involves thoughts, behaviors, actions that we can all learn and practice and we need to do them every day. Uh, Christina writes Kara Brock's uh, meditation rain can be really helpful. Absolutely. It is such a beautiful acceptance practice of recognize, allow, investigate, and nurture. Here are six pillars of resilience that I will send you off and, uh, you know, as, as you integrate this webinar, um, you know, about having this growth mindset that recognizing that we can grow even through this challenge, that our vulnerability is a strength. That social emotional intelligence. Our community connections can happen even across social distancing or physical distancing. That we can find creativity as a voice to connect to self, that, that capital S, that higher self. We can use embodiment as a tool and recognize that we have choice and control, that your thoughts, your behaviors make a difference in the outcome of your life. Lots of resilience practices. Here's my short list. Add to it, make it your own. Um, I'm going to just say one thing here. I don't want to use any of this as a plug for my own work. What I do want to do is let you know that I have a new book coming out that will be available for order next week. It's a practical guide for complex PTSD. It's a companion book for the workbook. And uh, it really couples with the new one. Um, and that what I want to just tell you is in this one are those practical strategies, a lot of which I've tossed in here as well, for what to do when you're experiencing an active trigger or flashback. So, um, so those are the pieces that I want to, um, to name here. So I've closed that out. Hopefully now we're just a little bit more face-to-face. -face. That took a little bit longer uh, to go through the slides, in part because I just wanted to respond to your comments as we, uh, as we go. And um, uh, let's see, Charlotte writes, oh, Charlotte, you were here, how lovely that you have to go and take a new intake. Um, uh, Denise, uh, focusing on the breath can be triggering. Absolutely, especially with just having asthma can be triggering, knowing that this is a respiratory illness. Um, and so coming in and out of breath or focusing on a different strategy of breath is a practice, a, a, a triggering practice for you. Fighting patterns of escape, which you cope with, uh, which is how you cope. So you can't escape with this, right? So how do you cope now when, when uh, that was your escape, uh, when that was your, uh, um, resource as a child, it's, it's hard. We're going to hold that little one that wants to run. We're going to give her as much leeway to run in your imagination as you can, Laura. Um, uh, Natasha, I'm sorry you missed that slide. You should have it. If you didn't get all of the slides, they are available for download. And uh, Chandler, if you put that link up again for those who didn't get the slides, uh, you'll find it here in the chat. Um, thank you so much. Grateful to be present for this webinar. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Um, great for the new book. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, Anessa, thank you. Thank you. Lots of thank yous here. Much gratitude. Good stuff. Finding a really good family systems therapist who understands your parts has been a significant for your recovery. I love that. Um, uh, I've been in counseling for 30 years and didn't know that you needed, I'm assuming, internal family systems therapy. Really good. Uh, Mary writes, thank you. This has been helpful. We don't need to be perfect. 
Ahu. Uh, it's 4 a.m. for Perry. Oh, thank you for joining so early in your time zone. Um, some, some, uh, here's the link to the handouts. Uh, thank you, says Christina. This webinar has served as a compassionate witness for you. Thank you, even more so than your husband who uh, doesn't understand what it's like to have PTSD. I hear you. Uh, thank you so much. Um, thanks for your sharing. I'm going to see if I can widen this so I can see your names. There we go. Uh, Natasha, thank you so generous and loving. Gratitude from Laura. Douglas says thank you. Um, Oh, this is just just lovely. I'm reading all of your gratitude. This was the book that you carried with you on your travels. It's the new book. Even thank you for that. Um, it means a lot to me. Um, as Katie says, you are a shining star with strong limbs, and I'm grateful for you too. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you, and deep bows. Deep bows all around. This webinar has been comforting, confirming, inspiring. Uh, holding and supporting you and your client work. I'm so grateful to hear that. Um, and uh, with two of your children safely upstairs. Huge and heartfelt thanks. Oh, all right, you all. I am just so grateful for all of you. I'm just continuing to scroll. Yes, do share this. Lorraine, you were on. I'm so grateful that, that you're here. How lovely to know. Um, audio copy should be available. It's going to be audio and video duty. So this whole link, we're going to try and upload it to, uh, to YouTube as well. So it should be shareable in a whole bunch of forms. And I'm so grateful to have it out there. Um, thank you all for joining um, <laughs> to a rock star. Thanks, Kathy. Thanks for being there. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, Shay writes, deep gratitude uh, for being here with us. I'm just appreciating. Yes, uh, Heather, I'll, I'll keep you all posted for a follow-up. Um, I have a feeling there's going to be a follow-up. Probably another 3 a.m. wake-up call. <laughs> all right. And um, you're welcome, Stephanie. I'm glad to offer my presence. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. And just, you know, if you can all thank yourselves for taking the time to be here. Um, Annabelle writes, thank you deeply for sharing the resources. Nice to see you. Thank you, Annabelle. I'm so glad that you could join. And, um, and uh, yes, you can rewatch this. You will, uh, Chandler, I think, uh, said he's going to send out through Zoom the link for all of you to have this in your inbox to rewatch. Uh, it was recorded. And um, I am going to thank you all. And we will close from here. May you be healthy. May you be well. May you be safe. May your loved ones be healthy, safe, and well. Thank you all. Namaste.